Thank you for joining us for tonight's program on the history of Thanksgiving with Melanie Kirkpatrick. This is our 25th and final program of what turned out to be our extended summer season. I'm Claire Noble, the program manager for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our executive director, Gail Mosier, our board chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. We're now in our 49th year of providing our community with thought-provoking and affordable programming. Two items before we get started. You'll see Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type your questions in there at any time. We'll get to those a little bit later in the program and we'll try to get to as many questions as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded, just give us a few days to get that up at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to take a moment to thank the individuals and organizations who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors are the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. The summer season was underwritten by Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher. Tonight's program was underwritten by Cindy and John Kelleher and Nancy Lipsky. The Vail Symposium is supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Funding has been provided to the Vail Symposium by Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act Economic Stabilization Plan 2020. If you're a Vail Symposium donor, thank you. If you're not but would like to be, please visit veilsymposium.org to donate. I'm especially grateful tonight to Rebecca and Chris Matlin, whose idea it was to host Melanie Kirkpatrick and provided the introduction. I hope you'll make plans to join us on Thursday, December 3rd. That's just next week when we kick off our winter season. And that first program will be starting a bit early at 5 p.m. It's our first program of the winter season and it's a documentary followed by a Q&A with the documentary filmmakers. The documentary is Kiss the Ground. Again, that's Thursday, December 3rd at 5 p.m. You can watch that in advance on Netflix. It is out on Netflix. And then join us at 6.30 for the Q&A. Also on December 7th, it's a Monday, an unusual day for us, but I think you'll agree this was an important day, week to change the date because the individual we'll be inviting that evening to speak with us is former National Security Advisor and retired Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He'll be joined in conversation with Jamie Metzl to, to discuss his recently released book, Battlegrounds. That's Monday, December 7th at our normal time of 6 p.m. Tonight, we get in the holiday spirit. In her book, Thanksgiving, the Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience, award-winning author Melanie Kirkpatrick journeys through four centuries of history, giving us a vivid portrait of our nation's best loved holiday. Melanie Kirkpatrick is a writer journalist based in Connecticut and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. She contributes reviews and commentary to various publications, including the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal for which she worked for 30 years. She's the author of two books, Thanksgiving, The Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience and Escape from North Korea, The Untold Story of Asia's Underground Railroad. Kirkpatrick is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a trustee emerita of Princeton in Asia, a member of the advisory board of the Human Freedom Program of the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas, a member of the Trollope Society, and a director of the America for Bulgaria Foundation. Welcome, Melanie. We are very interested and excited to hear what you have to say about Thanksgiving. Just a reminder to our audience, four questions Put those in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and I'll share those with Melanie later in the program. Thanks so much, Claire, for the warm introduction and hello everybody. I apologize for having to cancel at the last minute a couple of weeks ago and I'm so pleased that we were able to reschedule so that I could speak before Thanksgiving. I'd also like to say a, a special thanks to Chris and Rebecca Mat Matlin for introducing me to the Vail Symposium. My subject this evening is Thanksgiving and America, but let me begin with another homegrown American holiday, the 4th of July. 
One Fourth of July in the 19, early 1980s, uh, when I was living in Hong Kong and working for the Wall Street Journal there, I read a tidbit in a local newspaper about the holiday. Across the United States today, the columnist said, Americans are sitting down to uh, turkey dinners with all the trimmings. Now, expats had a good laugh about uh, the writer's confusion over American holidays. But I, it set me to thinking, in, in some sense, this was a natural er error. A non-American could be forgiven for conflating the two holidays. Both bind Americans to the larger history of our nation. Thanksgiving isn't a patriotic holiday per se, but it's full of patriotic feeling as we join together to give thanks for our shared blessings as a nation. The best expression of this aspect of Thanksgiving Day comes from Benjamin Franklin. Franklin called Thanksgiving a day of public felicity, a time to express gratitude to God for the quote, full enjoyment of liberty, civil and religious. Thanksgiving is America's oldest tradition, dating back to 1621, when the pilgrims joined together with Native Americans to celebrate the harvest. The holiday has grown up with the country, and it says a lot about who we are as Americans. It reflects our national identity as a grateful, generous, and inclusive people. No matter when our ancestors arrived in America, when we take our place at the Thanksgiving table, we are part of a continuum that dates back to that harvest feast of 399 years. The friendly coexistence between the English settlers and the Native Americans would last only a short while before it erupted in war. But the original Thanksgiving pointed the way to the diverse multicultural people we have become. My research into the holiday covers many aspects. I learned about early Thanksgivings in Virginia, Texas, Maine, and Florida that predated the arrival of the pilgrims. I traced the development of our charitable traditions of caring for the less fortunate on Thanksgiving Day. I looked at how football became part of the Thanksgiving rituals. And of course, there's dinner. I studied the history of Thanksgiving dinner and how it came to pass that on the fourth Thursday of every November, most Americans sit down to the same meal of turkey, cranberries, potatoes, and pie. I'd welcome questions on those topics and more. This evening, though, I want to devote my remarks to the aspect of the holiday that Benjamin Franklin particularly admired. That is, Thanksgiving as a time for expressing gratitude for our full enjoyment of liberty. I'll give illustrations from each of the centuries following the first Thanksgiving. First, of course, the pilgrims. There are two eyewitness accounts of the first Thanksgiving. Yet the word Thanksgiving doesn't appear in either of them. If you could travel back in time to 1621 and ask a pilgrim to define Thanksgiving Day, his answer might surprise you. For the pilgrims, a day of Thanksgiving wasn't marked by feasting, family, and fellowship, the happy hallmarks of the holiday we now celebrate. Rather, for the pilgrims, Days of Thanksgiving were religious, were days of religious observance. The original Thanksgivings were called to express gratitude to God for specific benefices, benefices such as a su successful harvest, propitious weather, or a military victory against Native Americans. For the pilgrims and other early European immigrants to our shores, a Thanksgiving day was profoundly religious set aside for prayer and worship. From the pilgrims' perspective, their first Thanksgiving in the New World didn't take place until two years after the event that we know as the first Thanksgiving. It was July 1623, and Governor William Bradford declared a day of Thanksgiving in gratitude for a rainfall that ended a drought and saved their harvest. All of the 13 colonies observed religious days of Thanksgiving, and they were the most direct influence on the development of the Thanksgiving holiday. At some point in the 1600s, each New England colony began to designate annual Thanksgiving days, usually in the autumn around the time of the harvest. These celebrations were deemed general Thanksgivings, 
That is, they weren't called for a specific event or blessing as has, previous, has had previously been the case, but for ordinary everyday blessings. Connecticut was the first to name a day of general Thanksgiving in 1639 and to make it an annual event. This was an important step toward the holiday we know today. Connecticut's decision to call a day of Thanksgiving for general blessings was controversial. Opponents argued that celebrating an annual Thanksgiving for general blessings rather than for a specific reason would make people take God's generous, generosity for granted. However, the idea caught on, and by the end of the 17th century, general Thanksgivings were the norm. Thanksgiving morning was usually spent at church with the afternoon and evening devoted to feasting with family and friends. By the time of the American Revolution, Thanksgiving was a well-established tradition, especially in New England. Then in the fall of 1789, as the first Congress was about to take a break from its deliberations, President George Washington proclaimed America's first Thanksgiving as a nation. This was the first presidential proclamation. Believe it or not, the idea of a national Thanksgiving was controversial, and there was vigorous debate in Congress about whether the president had the constitutional authority to designate a Thanksgiving day. There were two objections. <clears throat> The first had to do with the separation of powers. Opponents argued that the authority to proclaim a national Thanksgiving rested with governors, not with the president. <coughs> the second objection concerned the separation of church and state. Thanksgiving, it was argued, was a religious holiday. It was therefore inappropriate for the president to involve himself. Washington was a great man, as we all know, and he deftly addressed these objections. He agreed to issue a Thanksgiving proclamation, but with a twist. He sent his proclamation to all 13 governors, requesting, not ordering them to implement it. By this maneuver, he was acknowledging that a presidential proclamation doesn't have the force of law. But of course, such was the respect that a president uh, that Washington um, had in the minds of the Americans that every state acceded to his request and Thanksgiving Day was celebrated nationwide. Second, Thanksgiving, Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation was religiously inclusive. In doing this, he set a valuable precedent, one that subsequent presidents have followed. Not every governor, however, has followed that example. In the 1840s, for example, the Jews of Charleston refused to celebrate Thanksgiving because the governor had deemed it a Christian holiday. After Washington and into the first half of the 19th century, presidents mostly declined to call national Thanksgivings. Jefferson fam famously opposed a national Thanksgiving. In 1777, when he was governor of Virginia, he had issued a Thanksgiving proclamation, but he refused to do so as president. Governors, rather, named Thanksgiving days in the early part of the 19th century, but they did so without coordinating with one another. The confusing result was that the date of Thanksgiving varied from state to state. Many states celebrated in November, but a few marked the holiday in October or even in early December. A traveler with a carefully planned itinerary could manage to have a Thanksgiving dinner every week in the fall. Then in 1863, Lincoln decided to call a national Thanksgiving. What or who motivated Lincoln to do so? The answer is a woman who is known as the godmother of Thanksgiving. Her name is Sarah Josepha Hale. Sarah Josepha Hale was the editor of Godey's Ladies Book, the most widely circulated magazine of the antebellum period, one of the first national publications and one of the most influential periodic periodicals of its day. This was an extraordinary achievement for a woman in the first half of the 19th century. 
For years, Mrs. Hale used the pages of her powerful magazine to campaign for a national Thanksgiving. As the country moved towards civil war, she believed that a national celebration of Thanksgiving would help to preserve the union. Thanksgiving, she believed, had what she called a deep moral influence on the character of our nation. She sent hundreds of personal letters to presidents, governors, congressmen, and other influential Americans seeking their support for a national holiday. President Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan all declined to do so. Then in 1863, after receiving a persuasive letter from Mrs. Hale, Lincoln called a national Thanksgiving. This was the middle of the Civil War, of course, and Lincoln used the opportunity to appeal to national unity, setting the tone for the day when the country would once again be united. He called on every American, North and South, to celebrate Thanksgiving with one heart and one voice. What a lovely phrase that is, with one heart and one voice. Following Washington's example, Lincoln set Thanksgiving Day for the last Thursday of November. Lincoln's 1863 proclamation is regarded as the beginning of our national holiday. Um, every president since then has called for a national Thanksgiving. But there remained a snag before Mrs. Hale's dream of a national Thanksgiving was fully realized. While the overwhelming majority of governors went along with the date that Lincoln and later presidents named for Thanksgiving, they were under no obligation to do so. Presidential proclamations don't have the force of law. That required an act of Congress. For that, the country would have to wait until the 20th century. It was President Franklin Roosevelt who inadvertently goaded Congress into action. He had the temerity to change the date of Thanksgiving. In August 1939, FDR announced that he had decided to move Thanksgiving forward by a week. That is, a week earlier than what had by then become the traditional Thursday, last Thursday of the month. The country was in the midst of the Great Depression, and the president's stated reason was economic. There were five Thursdays in November that year, which meant that Thanksgiving Day, if celebrated on the last Thursday, would fall on the 30th of the month. That left just 20 shopping days till Christmas. Moving the holiday up a week to November 23rd would allow shoppers more time to make their purchases and so the president's dubious theater, uh, theory went, spend more money, thus giving the economy a lift. The idea was doomed from the start. Americans didn't have money to spend on anything, much less Christmas shopping. At his press conference in 1939, Roosevelt made the mistake of remarking that there was, quote unquote, nothing sacred about the date of Thanksgiving. He might as well have commanded that roast beef henceforth replace turkey as the star of the holiday meal. The president badly misread public opinion. His announcement was front page news the next day and the public outcry was swift and vociferous. College football coaches were particularly upset since most colleges ended their football seasons on Thanksgiving weekend. It was impossible to change the game schedule at such a late date. Roosevelt's switch turned Thanksgiving Day 1939 into a political hot potato. Now politicians had to read public opinion, examine the local business climate, consider political loyalties, and then decide which date to endorse as the official Thanksgiving. Do they stick with tradition and celebrate the holiday on November 30th? or follow FDR's lead and change the date to November 23rd. The 48 states were nearly divided, on, evenly divided on the question. 23 decided to stick with November 30th, while 22 adopted FDR's date of November 23rd. The remaining three, Texas, Mississippi, and the great state of Colorado had a happy solution to this problem. 
they decided to celebrate on both days. It wasn't long before people started referring to November 23rd as the Republican Thanksgiving and November, uh, November 30th, pardon me, as the Republican Thanksgiving and November 23rd as the Democratic Thanksgiving or even Franksgiving after Franklin Roosevelt. A Senator from New Hampshire wasn't so polite. He sarcastically suggested that Roosevelt break another tradition has the president given any thought to abolishing winter, he asked. Finally, in 1941, Roosevelt admitted defeat. Congress decided to take action and it passed a resolution fixing the date of future Thanksgivings as the fourth Thursday of November. Roosevelt signed it into law. And the Thanksgiving of 1942 was our first Thanksgiving as a matter of law. And uh, let me just break and say a, a, a quick word about Thanksgiving. That would have been the first Thanksgiving when the country was at war, at World War II. And of course, American soldiers were dying overseas. And Franklin uh, Roosevelt this time, I think made a, 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 a moving and um, powerful decision to call for Thanksgiving Day 1942 to be a Thanksgiving day and a day of prayer. He went on the radio and read his Thanksgiving proclamation aloud to the nation. And after that, he recited the 23rd Psalm. Then he went to the White House and had his dinner. Finally, uh, <clears throat> here in the 21st century, I'd like to recount a personal story that for me gives special meaning to Frank, Benjamin Franklin's characterization of Thanksgiving as a time to give thanks for the full enjoyment of liberty, civil and religious. Franklin's words were hammered home to me at many points during the course of my research, but no more so by the teenagers I interviewed at a New York City high school for immigrants. Newcomers High School is located in Queens, New York. And on the day I visited about a week before Thanksgiving, the school was home to 850 students who from more than 60 countries. They spoke 40 languages. I led discussions in three classes about the Thanksgiving holiday, which most of the teenagers were about to celebrate for the first time. These young newcomers had a very personal understanding of the earliest story at the heart of the American experience. For them, the Pilgrim story was their story, and the Pilgrim fathers and mothers were historical reflections of themselves. The Pilgrims themselves had been divided into two groups, those who came to the New World seeking religious freedom, and those who came here seeking better lives for themselves and their families. This was also the case for the students I met. A girl from Ivory Coast explained how her father had worked as a houseboy in the old country. Now she proudly told me he had a good job with the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Other kids came to the United States in search of the freedom to worship as they pleased. One boy told me he was from Tibet, a country that has not existed formally since China annexed it in 1950. He explained that his Buddhist family couldn't practice the religion of the Dalai Lama in China. But here in America, he, prob he proudly told me they could worship without fear. Then a girl spoke up. She was from Egypt, she said, and she was a Copt, which is an ancient form of Christianity. Her family had come to this country so that they could worship their religion without fear. For the students at Newcomers High, the pilgrim story mirrored their own experiences and they exuberantly claimed Thanksgiving as their own. For them, Thanksgiving was a rite of passage on their journey to American citizenship. I was reminded of the words of the late historian, Samuel Eliot Morrison, who famously wrote that the pilgrims are the spiritual ancestors of all Americans, whatever their stock, race, or creed. This brings me to the president, present day and a closing thought about the holiday we're going to celebrate in just a few days. This year, 
Thanksgiving takes place amid a political season characterized by an exceptionally ugly political discourse and a cultural divide that is tearing Americans apart. Americans are asking, can't we do better? As we gather together this week, I pray it will be a healing moment for our nation, a time to take stock of our many shared blessings, a time to consider what unites us as a nation, not what divides us. Let us remember Benjamin Franklin's description of Thanksgiving as a time to give thanks for the full enjoyment of liberty, civil and religious. Like Franklin, Washington, Lincoln, Sarah Joseph Hale, and others who, who have enriched our Thanksgiving tradition and helped to knit us together at a nation, we can give thanks. This history and more is worthy of our remembrance with grateful hearts on every Thanksgiving day. Thank you and happy Thanksgiving. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Melanie. And I just want to remember, remind our audience rather to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. So I wanted to start referencing some of the things you had discussed and tie it in with one of the, the questions we've received. Because you talked about how this became a holiday at times of national distress, Lincoln during the Civil War, FDR 1942 in the middle of World War II. And um, the question has to do with loss and you referenced our political climate. Uh, candidate and now uh, President-elect Biden talked during uh, the presidential debates about empty seats at the table. And so I think at the time he was referencing people who have died over the course of the year due to the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. but now, of course, many of us are in states that have our hot spots. So we have empty seats at the table, not just due to loss, but because we can't gather together with people. But if we go back to 1621, they were there with half the people they'd been with the year before. So it seems to me that there's an element of loss to this holiday as well. And how do we reconcile giving thanks, but also acknowledging loss at the same time? Well, you know, I, I think um, um, expressions of gratitude perhaps run deeper when in times of strife, in times of trouble. Uh, it, it, uh, it's kind of like the, um, those in the 17th century who said, uh, we don't want a general Thanksgiving. We think, uh, that, you know, you'll just take everything for granted. But if you uh, have a, th if you give Thanksgiving, have a Thanksgiving for a specific blessing, um, then it's more meaningful. So yeah, I guess loss does go hand in hand um, with the history of the holiday. Of course, it goes hand in hand with the history of our nation. So the, uh, the point being that Thanksgiving transcends the uh, immediate and it's, it's about something bigger. It seems to me that those pilgrims must have been incredibly resilient people to lose half of their, their friends and neighbors and still soldier on. Do, yeah, do I, think you're, I, th I think you're right. Um, but, uh, but please remember too, that they um, had a very strong faith on which to rely. And I, I think that made it easier. Um, uh, one you've mentioned twice now that half the number died. And I'll point out that only four women survived. There were only four women at that Thanksgiving table. And uh, they weren't even sitting around the table. They were cooking and serving. The, the women uh, wouldn't have eaten with the men and the 90, we know, uh, Indian braves who joined them, men. So um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And in 1863, uh, it was just after the Battle of Gettysburg. So um, where tremendous losses were um, uh, on, on both, found on both sides. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, the, the nation was grieving. Can you just address a little bit how, we have a question about how this first meal in 1621 came together and what assistance actually these Native Americans had provided to those pilgrims coming uh, in that year up until that dinner? 
Well, um, uh, William Bradford said um, that the pilgrims owed their lives to the, uh, Native Americans who helped them. And of course, they helped them, uh, they taught them how to plant, um, they taught them uh, where to fish, um, and they were extraordinarily uh, important to the survival of those English settlers. The, um, and when, uh, as to your question about um, what happened at that first Thanksgiving, uh, from the two first person accounts, one by William Bradford and the other by Edward Winslow, the pilgrim, we know that um, um, 90 Indian men appeared, um, yeah, kind of, out of walked out of the woods and came to the pilgrims um, a village and brought with them three deer that they had recently killed. So that we know, we can surmise from that, that venison was on the menu at uh, the first Thanksgiving. Um, the Native Americans uh, apparently stayed for three days and uh, the um, Pilgrims um, gave a demonstration of a shooting demonstration, a, a demonstration of their arms. Now, perhaps that was a way to tell the Native Americans that, hey, look, we have guns. We're 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 dangerous. I, you know, I don't know. Or, um, the uh, the um, father of American football. Uh, I can't remember his name now. He's a was a Yale football coach, Walter somebody or other. Anyway, he speculated that there was football at uh, the, that first Thanksgiving because Native Americans had a, um, a game where they, they kicked around a, a ball on the beach. So um, you know, football may have been part of the holiday from the beginning. The food um, uh, would surely have um, been thanks to the, the teaching that from the Native Americans uh, they had, we know that there was, uh, we think that there was corn and, and beans and squash. That's called the Three Sisters and the Natives, Native Americans taught the pilgrims how to grow the three crops together successfully. Um, there probably was lobster, which I think is very funny from our perspective to think of eating lobster in November uh, at Thanksgiving but it was plentiful at the time. Uh, and there, there could very well have been turkey because Bradford uh, talked about the, 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 the stores of wild turkey that were everywhere. And so it makes sense that they would have uh, shot turkey and had that for dinner. Um, we also know what they didn't eat and that we know that they didn't have um, pie because uh, they had no flour and they had no sugar. Um, if they found a pumpkin, they would have had to possibly eat it the way Native Americans do did at the time, which um, was kind of roasted in a stew of some sort. Uh, uh, or an early version of pumpkin pie was hollowing out a, a pumpkin and filling it with uh, cranberries or, or something sweet. Um, as for cranberries, uh, they probably didn't eat those either because uh, if, if, if you've ever eaten a cranberry, uh, a raw cranberry, you will not have eaten a second one. They're, they're <laughs> very, very sour. So, and the pilgrims, as I said, did not have sugar. The first uh, recipe for cranberry sauce uh, appear in, um, appears in the first American cookbook, which was published in uh, 1796. Uh, so, um, so Richard has a question. Uh, why Thursday? He finds the day <laughs> of the week awkward. Um, and I, it, it made me wonder, was there a significance to Thursday? Well, people have speculated that um, uh, it was one of the days that uh, wasn't taken. Uh, Sunday was, of course, the Sabbath. Um, um, Fridays were sometimes fasting days. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, but, but the early Thanksgivings were all over the place. They, they were not on Thursdays. 
the, uh, the reason it's a Thursday throughout most of our history is because that was the day that, that Washington selected. So, um, uh, but that's, it's really Washington's example that uh, rooted the holiday on that day. One of the things you said earlier about, you know, this is a day where most Americans sit down and eat the same meal. And yes. Diane has asked, how did turkey become the centerpiece if we're not even sure that that's one of the things they ate at that first yeah, meal? Yeah, yeah. Well, turkey, the, the, the broad outline of the Thanksgiving menu was um, established by the end of the 18th century. And it was, of course, based heavily on New England foods. And tur wild turkeys were abundant at that time. And um, there are not too many surviving accounts of, of the meal uh, uh, from the 18th century, but I've, I was able to uncover one where Turkey was definitely um, uh, the star, of, uh, one of the stars of the show, but not the only star. The typical New England meal in the uh, late 18th and into the 19th century was a meat course, lots of meat. There was a turkey, there was a, a, you know, a roast beef or a side of venison um, and with a lot of side dishes as well. And then the second course was dessert uh, with uh, lots and lots of different kinds of pies and uh, plum pudding and uh, other things like that. But turkeys, um, back to turkey, the turkey uh, um, became, um, you know, ex extinct at some point in the 19th century. Here in Connecticut, where I live, um, when I, I first um, came here about 25 years ago, I went into a, a little nature museum uh, in the next town, and they had a stuffed turkey in a, a window with a sign saying, uh, uh, the wild turkey was extinct in Connecticut in 1813. And uh, well, that may have been the case, but today they're everywhere. You, you see them all over the place this time of year. They were reintroduced into the state uh, about that time, I think, about 25 years ago. And, um, uh, but then as the 19th century Another, well, another thing about the 19th century and turkeys is that um, most um, uh, Americans lived on farms and uh, turkey is a barnyard animal. So it uh, was, was pretty easy to have a, a turkey and fatten him up all fall until you could uh, eat him uh, for the, the grand holiday celebration. But by the end of the 19th century, Turkey was kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, you gotta have a turkey was the attitude. Um, but um, I found a newspaper accounts that, that talked about uh, how if you couldn't afford a turkey, um, why don't, here are some recipes uh, for roast beef or roast pork that you could have instead of a turkey. Because at least um, in some parts of the country, Turkey was more expensive than, than beef. One of the things about Thanksgiving you mentioned earlier is the fact that it was initially a very religious holiday. And in fact, that might have impeded its adoption as a national holiday because of this question over uh, separation of church and state. Well, Stephen has a question about the religious roots of the holiday and how so many people today observe it and they have a, no apparent religious affiliations. So how do you view the meaning of the Thanksgiving holiday from its roots to how it's viewed today? Well, it's certainly true that, uh, and I, I would argue that the, the biggest change in uh, our Thanksgiving holiday has been religion. And uh, every, but I will point out that in every century, people have complained that uh, the holiday isn't religious enough, um, but it, uh, they, you know, I, I, I'm not so, um, what's the word, um, pessimistic on religion and Thanksgiving. I would say that um, there was a survey done a few years ago, and it showed that if there's a day of the year that Americans say grace around their table, it's Thanksgiving Day. And uh, Americans are... Uh, you know, a highly 
religious people in the sense that a high percentage of us believe in God. We are I think, far less um, observant than we were um, in past years. Uh, and you don't hear about uh, church services on Thursday morning anymore, though lots of communities have union church services during the um, uh, during Thanksgiving week. Though I will say, I just got an email this evening before signing on here, where um, um, a friend sent me an email about how um, the rabbi of his uh, synagogue in New York was um, having a, a Thanksgiving service that was going to be available um, on Zoom um, over um, on Thanksgiving morning. So, um, and I also would say that Thanksgiving is a, a very is very rare uh, in the sense that it's a holiday that can be celebrated by people of any religion and of no religion. It's something that, um, like America, uh, I guess, our attitude toward religion, it can be we accept people of all religion and people who have no faith. One of my surprises in your book was the <clears throat> The idea that Southerners were a little bit slower to adopt the holiday because it was seen as a Yankee holiday. So yeah. How did they eventually decide that they would get on board with the, 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 the tradition? And are there certain Southern stamps that are very different that they've put on the holiday that aren't celebrated other places? Well, uh, before the Civil War, uh, many of the Southern states did celebrate Thanksgiving. Most of them did actually. And it was um, uh, the governor of Virginia in the 1850s, I believe, Hammond, uh, James Hammond, I think was his name, who called it a damned Yankee holiday and um, wanted nothing to do with it. And he complained that uh, uh, preachers in the North used the occasion of the holiday to preach sermons against slavery, and therefore he wanted nothing to do with it. But um, there was a tradition of celebrating Thanksgiving in the South. And after the, the Civil War, um, that eventually took hold again. There were states that, um, 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 it, it took a while, but certainly by the end of the 19th century, if not a, a decade or so before um, the southern states were on board. You know, it, it's a fun holiday. It's, it's kind of hard not to like it. Um, and so uh, um, it, as far as the culinary traditions, there are, oh, things like sweet potato pie or that... Um, are more Southern, um, cornbread stuffing that are more Southern. But of course, um, in our own society where we are so, um, you know, we're, we're not focused on regional foods so much anymore as, uh, as uh, we once were, that uh, just about anything goes. And the ethnic um, foods that are now staples of, of people's Thanksgiving dinner are, are interesting too. Well, I don't want to leave the South just yet because there was something else in your book that I found very curious. And that was Jefferson Davis's Thanksgiving uh, uh, yeah. proclamation also during the Civil War. But he called for a national day of humiliation and prayer. And I was really struck by the use of that word. And I'm wondering if that word had a different meaning in the 19th century or why he would have chosen the word humiliation. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I hadn't really thought about that, but um, I didn't speak about this in my remarks, but Thanksgiving days were um, closely associated with uh, days of fasting and um, there were certainly governors and the before the country existed, um, uh, uh, you know, governors of the individual colonies or of individual communities um, or pastors who would call for a day of fasting um, to, um, uh, you know, atone for one's sins. And then uh, a day of fasting would be, would be followed eventually by a day of Thanksgiving, but the, the two were closely associated. And humiliation probably referred to uh, the idea that was very 
prevalent in the Civil War that Americans were being punished for um, insufficient, um, uh, for its sins, this, either the sin of slavery if you were in the North um, or, and, and you can look at Lincoln's um, uh, proclamation as well. And he, um, he talks, I, I can't remember the words right now, but he, he, he talks about how we uh, need to um, atone for our, our sins. Um, Lincoln and Jefferson Davies both issued Thanksgiving proclamations early on in the war as um, after victories uh, in the early years of the war after Jefferson Davies, Davis did after Confederate uh, victories. And then Lincoln issued a couple, including one right after Getz Gettysburg. But these were different. These were religious days of Thanksgiving. Uh, they weren't um, days of Thanksgiving where you would uh, have a family gathering uh, or even necessarily um, uh, uh, take it as a, a holiday. It was very much, the idea was that you spend it in prayer and at church. Before I forget, Felicia would like to know what the name of the first cookbook was. You had mentioned that earlier in the program. Oh, yes. It's, it's written by um, Amelia Simmons. And let me give you the exact name. It's called American Cookery. And there, it's, it's easily available online uh, and I recommend it. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. You can read, there are several recipes for pumpkin pie and it's the first cookbook that includes res, uh, ingredients that are found in, in the new world. Um, the uh, previous cookbooks uh, you know, that, um, that were used in America came from England and they weren't necessarily uh, uh, attuned to what was available here. And in this particularly, in this cookbook, uh, there, is, uh, there are recipes for cranberries, there are recipes for Indian pudding, which is, um, if, if you're anybody in a, is a New Englander out there in the audience, you may have had Indian pudding. Uh, it's made from cornmeal and ginger and spices, and it, it's really quite delicious. But uh, you only see it uh, in, in places where there is cornmeal available. This time of year, there's a lot of commentary about Thanksgiving, and some of it is quite negative. And it's my sense that as a nation, we should have a full and fair accounting of our history. But it's my sense that his, that Thanksgiving is a bit of a scapegoat and but that may not be shared by some of our questioners because we've had a number of people ask questions around the idea of how horribly Native Americans were treated and how essentially the arrival of colonists from Europe ended their civilization. Um, I, I just would like you to comment on how that concept gets tied in with the, the celebration of Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, the, uh, first I would say that uh, in, in my mind, at least, I, I look at that first Thanksgiving as a, a real moment in time that um, uh, was extremely positive where the, the two peoples um, lived together in peace and supported one another. And uh, it, I, 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 to me, it represents um, an ideal that uh, we as a country uh, still must strive toward. Um, but, uh, and, and historically, uh, you know, the, the, it really, peace, the peace didn't last. Within 50 years, the um, uh, native people of New England were uh, decimated. And uh, by the time, oh, within 100 years of the arrival of the Native American, of the pilgrims, there weren't many left. Uh, there were terrible massacres, but of course it worked both ways. There were terrible massacres and attacks on the English as well. Um, you know, do I, am, am I glad that the, um, that the pilgrims came to our country and the English um, 
system, you know, prevailed. Yeah, I guess I am, but I feel terrible. Of course, it's terrible that the uh, native people were destroyed. Um, it was a violent era, a terribly violent era, and the stories one reads um, about the the violence that um, each group of people inflicted on the other are pretty terrible. Um, I, there's one chapter in my book on how Native Americans see Thanksgiving. And um, I, I really didn't know what to expect when I began to research it. And um, there, are a, there are two groups in particular who have been protesting the holiday for a while. One is um, a group who since the 1970s uh, call a Thanksgiving a day of mourning and they have a a vigil uh, in Plymouth on every Thanksgiving day. The other group um, was a, is a group in um, uh, the San Francisco area that sponsors a, 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 a native Thanksgiving every Thanksgiving morning on the island of Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. And um, it started off again I, around the 70s as a, a more militant occasion that uh, they called it the unthanksgiving and then some years later they decided not to be so militant and in part because their group valued thanksgiving as americans i spoke to the head of the group who talked about how um, this thanksgiving celebration takes place on alcatraz it's a at dawn, it's um, a, nat a native um, celebration with um, drum music and, and um, other such things. And then they all get back on the ferries and uh, come to San Francisco and go home in time to put a, a turkey in the oven. And she said to me that she, uh, uh, as an American, she celebrates um, with joy Thanksgiving. As a Native American, she also uses the day as a time to reflect on the heritage of her people. Today, uh, Thanksgiving seems to be perhaps a little bit under assault by commercialism. And Bob is asking about <laughs> that as well, because for the longest time, Thanksgiving was free of that. It was largely football and food and family. Uh, but now he wonders and if faith like and faith another and faith. another F. Um, but now he's wondering if uh, things like Black Friday sales are going to encroach and erode this holiday. I know that some retailers have said they won't open on Thanksgiving, which I kind of thought was a given. But that leads me to believe that some retailers will be open on Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we're a nation of free choices and and. Uh, some uh, retailers will choose to open. I, I sure wouldn't want to work for one of them. And uh, I, I applaud uh, retailers who close for the day and give their, their employees a day off. <clears throat> As for Black Friday, you know, there's commercialism all around us and uh, you, can op you can embrace it or close your eyes to it, whatever you want. But Thanks. I think Black Friday is actually a positive sign in a way because uh, it shows that our uh, economy is booming. People are buying because they have the resources to buy. A lot of them are buying gifts for people. And also <coughs> it's the beginning of the giving season. And we find, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that um, Americans uh, are the most generous people in the world by <coughs> many measures. And uh, Thanksgiving taps into that generosity. Uh, you may have heard of Giving Tuesday, which is a, a virtual uh, um, uh, fundraising opportunity for nonprofits. And this grew out of Thanksgiving uh, it grew out of the um, 92nd Street Y, um, a Jewish organization on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And uh, it's not explicitly religious, of course, but it, it grew out of the Jewish tradition of 
um, uh, healing the community and um, uh, um, participating in helping the less fortunate. Um, so I, I, you know, uh, if, it, if, if it wasn't Black Friday, it would be something else. It's, um, I, 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 you certainly can escape it, but it's an individual choice. So circling back to uh, this discussion of Native Americans, Lauren Hershey uh, just pointed out, and perhaps it's the, the age of COVID that prompted this, but he said the Native American Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, indicates that the European-born diseases did most of the killing of Native Americans. And could, he's asking if you could expand upon that. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, the pilgrims and the Native Americans. I've read the same thing, and it doesn't surprise me, but I, I, I can't respond any further to that. Um, so we also got a question uh, from Cheryl, uh, who insists that Canada had the first Thanksgiving. Yes. Oh, no. oh, well, yes, in a way. But uh, I know you mentioned in your book, there's a lot of people who claim to have the first Thanksgiving. Yes, yes. Well, let me, um, I, I love this story. It was so something that um, when I started out writing the book, I had no idea I'd be writing about Thanksgivings that predated the, the pilgrims. But um, in a way, you're right, because the first European Thanksgiving in, uh, uh, in North America was probably um, Martin Frobisher, the English explorer, uh, up in the Arctic. And it was in the late, six, late 16th century, 1590-something where um, two of his ships uh, in the group that had, were sailing in that area got lost. And when he found them and they all came together again, they had a Thanksgiving celebration. So that's arguably the first European Thanksgiving in uh, the New World. Um, the Canadian Thanksgiving today uh, is celebrated on our Columbus Day weekend. And it's not celebrate. It's celebrated by most of the provinces. It's not such a big deal in Canada the way it is here, for the simple reason I think that it's not really associated with Canadian history the way um, our Thanksgiving is. It doesn't say it. It doesn't. It's not associated with um, uh, you know any particular event or set of values or, or anything. The um, speculation is that Thanksgiving went to Canada. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, and that uh, loyalists from the Boston area who um, wanted to escape uh, to uh, Canada took the holiday with them. And while we're on the subject of, of early Thanksgivings, I will point out that the earliest Thanksgivings on our continent were, of course, the Native American ones. And um, uh, because there's not a written culture, we don't know a whole lot about them. Um, the pilgrim uh, William, uh, the pilgrim uh, Edward Winslow, recounts a, a story um, about a meeting with an interpreter with a, a, a native leader, and uh, uh, Winslow bowed his head and said grace before meal, before his meal, and the uh, uh, native leader asked him, "Why are you doing this?" And he explained what he was doing and. The, um, the Native Americans said, yes, yes, I understand. We, we do the same kind of thing. Um, uh, so I, I loved that connection between the, the pilgrim and um, the Native American. Though he did, when, uh, when uh, Winslow explained the Ten Commandments to him, the man was nodding and saying, yeah, yeah, good. This, I believe this, except he didn't like uh, the seventh commandment, which is to, I, I, uh, which is do not commit adultery. <laughs> he, he, he thought that was a bad idea. And uh, finally, on the subject of Native uh, of American Thanksgivings, I'll say that uh, Reagan was the first president to honor that tradition. And uh, in his uh, Thanksgiving, one of his Thanksgiving proclamations, he recite, he included a, a Seneca Nation prayer. Well, we're just about out of time. So my last question is, what will you be doing for Thanksgiving? What will be um, Thanksgiving like in your household this year? Oh, well, thank you. Like, I think like most of our many Americans, uh, there are going to be fewer people around our table this year. 
but we will still have a few family members who were able to drive here. And, um, you know, it was a, a challenging, a little bit challenging to decide uh, exactly how to handle this. Uh, my husband and I have been very um, careful and we live in the country and, uh, you know, there's no virus in the woods, but uh, we have to get out and about uh, a little bit. Um, and uh, when I was sick a couple of weeks ago and had to cancel our first session, um, uh, you know, we, we were afraid it was COVID and fortunately it was not. But uh, uh, we will, you know, we, we have our traditional meal and uh, I'll be baking, an, we have four apple trees, so I'll be baking a, an apple pie from uh, apples from our tree. And um, that was going to be my next question, oh. apple or pumpkin? Yeah. Or both? Yeah, I, I, I'm uh, ecumenical on uh, <laughs> the pies. I think uh, we have to have everything at the table if possible. With only a few people though, you, you know, can't have too many pies. Melanie, thank you so much for a wonderful program. Thank you for helping getting our community in the holiday spirit. And I wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And to everyone who joined us for tonight's program, I wish you also a happy Thanksgiving. And I hope you'll join us on December 3rd. It's a Thursday for our first program of the winter season. Good night, everyone.